preaching for us today. I like to hear Andy. The second thing is that I get to listen. I mean, that's just, that's exciting for me when I get to get preached to and, um, you know, get to, get to be fed myself. So I'm really looking forward to this. Um, Andy is just, uh, he's incredibly experienced, you know, um, knows his Bible very, very well. And I, and, and he's just interesting to listen to. So Hey, I was I was kidding him a while ago. He's a minimalist. He doesn't have any powerpoints. The guys in the sound booth are going, no, 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 no powerpoints. What are we going to do? What are we supposed to do? So uh, doesn't have to make do. Just just pay attention. Okay, take some notes. But with without any um, uh, further introduction, I'm going to ask Andy to come and bring God's word for us today. It is wonderful to be here. Um, it's wonderful, wonderful to share God's word and to preach this morning. I am going to be preaching out of Job. So if you have a Bible or a phone or an iPad or something that has the Bible in, I'm going to preach out of the book of Job. And it's always good to be here, by the way. It was in a few places this last week. I was out in Perm, Russia, um, Achor, and then I was up to Siktivkar, which is a little bit farther north. Those were my experiences in Russia the last couple of weeks. And I, last week I was in Perm. There's a, a this is on, isn't it? Okay, I'm not hearing anything. There is a there was a conference that was there, and it's a pastors' conference, one of the area regions out there in the Perm region. So there's a number of people. I always have to speak in that place. I I can preach in Russian. I preach simpler in Russian, and you know, but that time I had to do a translate. I did use a translator because the Bible language is very tough. If Russian Bible language is challenging to me still. Kind of like I have to learn Russian and then Bible Russian. And it's the Old Testament, and it's a challenge. And we had international guests there, so I said, I'll, I'll choose to just go through an interpreter. But I had spent a few days just all with these. When I'm uh, for a week in Russian, I'm thinking in Russian. I almost have to, like, translate back in English because my brain is just stuck in Russian. And I'll have conversations with my Like, in the middle of the night, when I get back, in the middle of the night, I wake up. I'll talk to Nancy in Russian. And all these things are coming in there. But my Russian is not high, high level. I, I I will just talk in Russian, I think in Russian, and then I get to the end and I go, I don't know that word. You know, how do I say that? You know, so I'm always trying to find an answer on how to say it. But I just think that way. And it's hard, because sometimes you go, what is that word? What is that word? And we're looking for the answer. So how many of you have some rudimentary knowledge of Russian? You speak Russian other than, I hope you guys do. Yes, thank you very much. How many of you, as Russian is a second language? Have you learned Russian as a second language? How many of you have Google Translate on your phone? How many of you have Google Translate for English? Right? No, I don't know. Maybe you do. Because I mean, you do. sometimes you look up a word. Oh, that is fantastic. You know, I got I have to look that up. I was talking to some of the sisters back here that, about my girls come home and they say, "Oh, I learned some Korean words today." You know, and I, and she tried to share her name in Korean. I think, how do I hear that? You know, I always have a hard time even hearing the names in Korean. But my girls love learning Korean words. We're always looking for the answer, and so much that there is. A modern day word, the phrase that we've turned into a verb. And what is it? Just Google it. Right? I want to look for the answer. Probably most of us have tried that. I wonder who, you know, we'll have a conversation. I wonder who won that. Or, you know, when was the War of 1812? Oh, let's Google it. You know, well, anyway, <laughs> hopefully you know that one. Um, but we, you know, we will look for the answer. And so I am reading, I was reading Job. It started about a week and a half ago, and Job is one of the most interesting books of the Bible. And so this has been in my mind, I'm kind of preaching out of what I've been looking at, because the title of this message is, There Are No Easy Answers. That's what the book of Job is about. There's no easy answers. I was in high school, probably a, a sophomore in high school, we got a brand new science teacher. His name was Mr. Tanji. I think he was Hawaiian. I, I don't know the ethnic background. Mr. Tanji was a, kind of an interesting teacher. I think he only lasted two years, okay? So that'll tell you that he wasn't a great teacher. What he did was, we'd walk into class, and we'd study, we'd do all the science stuff, and he said, okay, it's time for the test. And he'd say, 
And the test answers would be in row. You know, you have to match, do all these matching things. So here's a list over here, and you had to match them with the answers on this side. Okay, so there's 25 on this side, 25 on this side. First time we matched it, they were A, B, C, D, in exact alphabetical order. We're kind of going, what is wrong with here? Is this, you know, what is, he goes, I'm not going to give you the answers, but, you know, and that's, okay, that's interesting. The second test was backwards, Z, Y, X, the whole answers. And so it was almost a joke because people would not even study. They already knew the answers because it just had to be one of those rows or the other until the last test of the year. And we did it totally random. And 99% of the people failed. I didn't fail because I actually did study. But, I mean, the rest of them didn't even try, and they all failed. We want to know the answers. So taking tests, all of us, if we could take the test with the answers, it would be pretty easy, wouldn't it? Job is a challenge because when I read this, it's a passage where you don't get a lot of easy answers. I'm going to watch this so I don't tip my thing over. Job, um, I'll just, just open your Bibles and turn to the book of Job. We'll get that started. It is, Job is one of the oldest, probably the oldest book of the Bible. No known author, really. They don't know where it came from, what it is. It sets itself this wisdom literature. You know, there's a lot of guessing about it. It's probably started from an oral tradition and going on. But it, it's a, a story where Job, in the beginning, the example is, is him being a wealthy man. He's got everything. He has kids. He's got wealth. Everything that he touches is blessed. And then there's this conversation that happens in, in the heavens, in a sense. And that's how we, we know this where the story is coming from. He comes and he says, God and the enemy say, oh, look at, look at Job. He is serving me, God says. And, and Satan replies, yeah, but everything is great. That's why. If you would take everything away, he would not serve you. And the process, the conversation goes on. And you'll see and what happens in Job is Job loses everything. There's two kind of stages to this. And he loses everything. Then the rest of the book is him and these discussions between friends as they try to give him advice, bad advice. And then at the end, God reveals himself and talks. Okay, so that's this entire story that is going on there. So Job has everything. Now, the wisdom literature, the wisdom culture at that time is they taught something very clear. If you are good, good things happen to you. If you are bad and sin, bad things will happen to you. The title of this message, I said there's no easy answers, but really the other one could be a, a well-known book that I, I love that I hand out many times, Where is God When It Hurts? And Philip Yancey wrote this book a long time ago, Where is God When It, when it Doesn't Make Sense? You know, where is, where is God When It Hurts? Because Job challenges that idea. So I, I'm looking at some things here today. What, what you saw is Job's losing everything, even to the point of his health, where he's sitting here, it sounds terrible, scraping the sores off. You know, he's on this, on this pile of ashes type thing and scraping the sores, everything. He only, the only thing he had left was his life. And even that was not comfortable. And his three friends come, another friend comes later, and they start telling him all this stuff. Now, as you read Job, I have always wondered, does that make sense? It almost makes the most sense when you read it through all at once, because you start getting the, the spirit of this. You just pull little verses out and context out, it doesn't make sense in there. There's one, one passage that I think I've always used as one of my favorite verses. Okay, let's see if I can find it in here. Um, oh, there's one that uh, I love. I can't remember the verse right now, but I quoted it many times because I said, I think it's one of those kind of days. It says, my breath is offensive even to my wife. Okay, that is one of those verses that you can pull out of context. Um, but it's a, this, this story is so interesting because his friends give kind of good advice, but kind of bad advice. They, they start lecturing him. Why is all this bad thing happening to you? It must have been because of sin. So let me give you the things that I pulled out of this book for this week. <clears throat> Number one, we all want the answers to our questions. We all have the, we all want to know why. Why did this happen? And that's probably what this story comes out of. Then, why did this happen? When I, I remember as a, as a teenager, and I had a nephew who was younger than me, and he was at that age where everything was why. Have you ever had a kid that did that, where just like nonstop? They were probably five years old. He was probably five or six years old, and they'd say. Oh, look at the cows eating grass. Well, why? Um, 
Well, then after you grasp it, that's your food. Well, why? And you go and you just take the whole thing, not, and you go on and on. And finally, after, after about the tenth, why? You just say, because I said so, you know. <laughs> we all want to know why sometimes. Why did this happen? Now, we really say it when tragedies happen. How many of you had a difficult thing ever happen in your life? Anybody? Okay. If you have not raised your hand, just give a time, okay? And if you have not raised your hand, um, you're, you're lying, okay? Because <laughs> something is happening. Um, we have death. There's loss. There's tragedies. We were just talking about somebody, your car getting towed twice. You know, I mean, there's negative things happen. Bad things happen. We have people get sick. We have tragedies, you know, of financial relationship tragedies. The why, why did this happen to me? Why did it happen? We all want to know why. There was a woman in our church many years ago, Colleen. She started coming to the church because her kids did. Um, that's all. Her and her husband, Mike, were uh, really good pagans. Okay, They were not serving Christ. Her dad was an atheist, and her mom was a Catholic, just by tradition. Okay, now That's it. She didn't go to the Catholic Church, so she was, she did not believe in God, was bitter, cynical toward the church, didn't like anything. And she started coming to the church, and I did a class on a book, we had many adult classes at that time, but one of the classes I was leading was The Case for Christ. It's a really nice book, it's a good book, talking about apologetics, is one guy who used to be a law reporter was writing these chapters, and he, he was investigating if there was really a God, and so this was kind of part of his story. And the questions were from chapter after chapter. One was, it started with the chapter, if there's a God, why are bad things in this world? If there's a good, if God is good, why would there be such a thing as Satan? And we walked stage by stage this and clean every week would go, okay, I cannot believe in God. Look at this, there is no reason. And we would talk about it and we'd say, well, what if you look at it from this different angle? And at the end of that class, she'd say, yeah, I suppose that could really work. About 12 weeks into it, at the end of this, she said, okay, now I'm ready to follow Christ. You answered all my whys. I mean, you don't answer everything completely, but at least you took away the walls that allowed her to come to Christ. We all want to know why. We all want to know, why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to me? And I think that is a common human response. So part of it is, I, I, I learned out of this, the questions that Job said, they've there, been there for years. They've been through every, for centuries and centuries and centuries. Why do I have to suffer? Why do bad things happen? In Job 1, verse 20, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground and worshiped and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked I'll depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. He had everything happen and this is the first chapter, and he starts off, and his speeches afterwards are about why is this happening to me? The second thing I got out of this book as I've been reading it is there are very few easy answers. His friends come now, and they start talking to him, and they lecture him. In fact, verse chapter 8, um, one of the guys, Bildad, says in chapter 8, verse 1, How long will you say such things, Job? Your words are like a blustering wind. Because Job kept saying, I, I haven't done anything. I'm innocent. I'm, why am I doing this? The friends before would say, ah, this is because your kids sin. This is because you sin. This is because this is wrong. That is why God is judging you. And he said, but I didn't do anything. And his friend says, in verse 3 of chapter 8, Does God pervert justice? Does the Almighty pervert what is right? When your children sinned against him, he gave over them to the penalty of their sin. See, that is why it happened. But if you seek God earnestly and plead with the Almighty, if you are pure and upright, even now he'll rouse himself on your behalf and restore you to your prosperous state. Sometimes we want to make things simple. We want an easy answer. There are very few easy answers. Now that's really encouraging, isn't it? You know, I just said something. You're not going to get the answer to your question. Doesn't that sound terrible? We all want it. People are seeking it all the time. I remember I just, I was in doing an article. Every once in a while, I, I, I get asked by an organization to do a photography, and I write an article for them. So one or two a year, maybe. And I happen to be in China, in Hainan, China, which is a hot, hot island. Uh, it's like, it's supposed to be the Hawaii of China, but I wouldn't want to go there because it's too hot for me, okay? It is just hot, hot, hot. And 
there's a spot out here where there's this gigantic Buddhist idol. Okay, I mean, it is 100, 200 feet tall. I mean, it's enormous. And there's this guy coming down along the sidewalk because it's out on the sea. There's like this long sidewalk. And he would walk 10 feet and then he would lay, he had this little process, kneel, forehead on the ground, prostrate on the ground. Then he would stand up and walk another 15 or 20 feet, get down, kneel, face on the ground. He's looking for those answers. If I do this enough, the process, if I do it enough, I will receive atonement for my sins. Our world is full of that. You see people, they put ashes on their forehead or put uh, paint on their forehead in Hinduism, and they're looking for the answers. There's very few easy answers, but God will come back to them. There is an answer at the end, he says, but there are very few easy answers. When we follow God, sometimes we have to live with the tensions. Sometimes we want to make things simple. We make things simple. Ah, in fact, that is probably my third point. And this is almost a parenthesis, okay? Friends in situations like this don't give easy answers. Just be there. Friends start off pretty good because they were just hanging there. But where they got into trouble is when they started telling them what was wrong. Now, this is maybe not the point of the, the book, but it's what I took out of it, okay? As a friend, sometimes I don't need to answer everybody's problem. Why, why did your parent just die? Why did a child suffer? Why am I sick? Why have we had financial ruin? Why have we not been able to have kids? Why have we not had this? Why, why, why? And sometimes the best thing I can say is, I don't know. I don't know. But I know that God hurts with us. In fact, the scriptures say that more than anything else. Jesus wept. Let's go back to that. Where does that, anyone know where that, that story came from? Where is that verse? The short, one of the shortest verses in the Bible. Jesus wept. What was the miracle that surrounded that? Who knows? Raising of Lazarus. Yeah. So what happened in Lazarus? Let's kind of think this thing through. Remember, they, Jesus is a long ways away. He gets news. Hurry, come home. Why? Why was he supposed to come home? Lazarus is sick. What did Jesus do, though? He delayed, right? It's like he poked around. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah. Let me, let me take some time here. Let me put some stuff in my suitcase. No, not really. But I mean, he's just, you know, let me check what the weather is like and and by the time he got there on the way, what did he hear? He's dead. Jesus comes. The sisters are there. They're comforting him. And it's, it's a fantastic story. I love the story of this. There's one point, you know, I mean, really, the, we're going to see why. I mean, Jesus showed his power even over death. But I, that passage of Scripture where it says simply, Jesus wept. We have a God that weeps for us. I think that's one of the most significant things that we can remember. Our God is not distant. He's not a cold Lord. Jesus cares for us. He understands our pain. He understands our hurt. People often say, why did not, why did not Jesus didn't do something? Why did God not do something for those people that died? Why did he not do something for that tragedy that just happened in this country or that country? Why did he not? And what I always say is, he did. He did. He came and he died on a cross and he said, I will change this world. Jesus did. Now in the immediate and in a particular situation, we don't understand that. But he did act for us. And he does love us. And he weeps for us. And we can cast our cares now on him because he cares for us. But Job's friends were not really good at that. I have had this many times. In fact, I've pastored many, for many years and it is one of the hardest things when you're in the moment of tragedy. I've been in hospital rooms where somebody has had cancer or they're sick. And I've heard people sometimes come in and they'll make phrases like, if you just had more faith. Uh, when that happens, I just always want to get up and just punch them. Okay, now I, I, maybe that's not really a holy response, but when somebody gives short little Christian cliches, well, Jesus loves you, you know. He knows you can handle it, right? He doesn't give more than you can handle. I hate that kind of phrase. You know, I don't, don't give me those things right now. Just be there as a friend. So often as friends, as Christians, we want to simplify it. Huh? But God's in control. Yeah, that isn't, that's really great. But, you know, my, my brother just died. You know, that is not really helping me right now. God is great. You know, I don't feel like God is great. Where is God? So as friends... Let's sometimes just be with people. We don't need to say, ah, he's in a better place right now. Yeah, that's great. We know that. I mean, just hurt with people. We need to bear one another's burdens. 
The New Testament says that, and Paul shared that very clearly, bear one another's burdens. Cast your cares upon Jesus because he cares for us. He knows there's pain, but we can walk alongside one another and encourage him. I even heard of this last week, kind of as a joke. It was a, um, a joke. I was out when I was in Russia. Uh, we were out. Sorry, I am in Russia. I'm right now in Siberia. That's what I was trying to say. Thank you, Nancy, for correcting me. I was, I was in Madagascar right now for some reason. Now. Uh, I was out in Siberia, and somebody made a joke because they said, What's wrong? Haven't you been paying your tithe? You know, I, and I said, No, no, you know, I have done it. But we almost have these little fixations sometimes that. Well, let's give advice. That happened to you, so I need to tell you. Maybe you have something wrong in your life. And, and that is not always the case. Now, there is cases. I mean, we love to simplify things, like I said. We like to blame things on the sovereignty of God. Okay, we'll go that route. And I'll, I'll talk about that in just a second. But there are a few easy answers. So friends, as a parenthesis, don't just do that. The one thing I got out of this is the fourth one. We'll never know all the answers, so live with it. Now, that is probably the, the entire point of Job. You'll never have all the answers, and you just have to live and trust God. We have to learn how to trust God. Um, grace and works. Let me just go out with this one. These are tensions that we have to live with. We don't. We can't oversimplify. I, God's grace is so so there for us. God, what can we do to earn our salvation? Absolutely nothing, right? But faith without what is dead, faith without works is dead. So sometimes we, the way we simplify it is we always move one way or the other. We say it's grace. Hey, you can't do anything. Just follow God and he loves you. He loves everyone. And the other extreme goes the other way. I have got to do this. I've got to read my Bible. I've got to give some money. I've got to go this. And then God will love me. But there's some kind of tension in between that we have to live with. The sovereignty of God versus our free will. There's another one. Sometimes we love to blame things on the sovereignty of God. Somebody, who, a guy who believes in the great sovereignty of God was going down the steps, tripped, all the way, rolled three floors down, got up and said, well, thank God I got that over with. You know, it was fate anyway. You know, it was just destiny. Um, it's, you know, we believe sometimes in the sovereignty of God. But if I walk out here and just say, I'm going to walk right across the street, don't look left and right, and a car smacks me, is that the sovereignty of God or my idiotic decision to walk across without looking left or right? My decision, right? God set some things in place. And sometimes we just have to live with the tension of that. We have to live with the tension of a loving God but also a God that's holy. Oh, I don't. We have a God that loves us and cares for us so much. We also have a God that's holy, and we have to live with that type of tension. We'll never know all the answers. And at the end of this book, God shows up. Now it's two chapters that happen there, and God starts talking to Job, and it's a very interesting passage of scripture. Let me get back to it here. Um, the Lord speaks in verse thirty-eight. Uh, chapter 38, sorry. The Lord answered Job out of the storm. Very significant. I, th I think it's kind of interesting. I don't know if it's supposed to be there, but it says the Lord answered Job out of the storm. We hear God's voice sometimes the best when we're in the middle of a storm. When we are right there, everything slows down, time slows down, and, and we hear God's still small voice. So often in Scripture, God speaks in the middle of a storm. And his answers are, who is this that darkens my counsel? Brace yourself like a man and I'll question. And he starts walking through an entire list of things. And they're beautiful. I mean, where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Who marked off its dimension? Surely you. Who stretched a measuring line across it? Where were you? Verse 8 of chapter 38. Who shut up the sea behind the doors and it burst forth from the womb? When I made the clouds and garment. And he talks about the whole creation process. Where are the clouds? And were you there when I made the earth? Were you there when I separated the seas? Have you seen all these things? He goes through for another chapter. In 38, you know where the mountain, chapter 38, you know when the mountain goes give birth. You watch when the doe bears her fawn. And he talks about creation after creation. And he never answers Job's question. I think that's one of the interesting things. He never lifts it, never lifts it at all. He just says, I'm God. I created it. And you'll never know. Your wisdom is not the same as my wisdom. And that is what we come down to. Job challenges me to say, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for he is with me. And it doesn't even make it simple for me. It just says, trust the Lord. 
We can trust God through it all. Job is so clear on that. We can just simply trust God. There's a little verse down there that, in chapter 19 that was prophetic. And this is kind of go back. I'm, I'm moving you back and forth in the book of Job a little bit. But in chapter 19, it says in verse 25, this is probably a prophetic word in a sense that Job says before he even understood it. But this is really more the answer. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, and in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. In the middle of all of his tragedies, in the middle of all of his, his struggling, he says, there will be a day that I will stand. I know my Redeemer lives, even when I am hurting. I talked about the friends. I talked about um, the answers. But I, the, the other thing I want to share is, God is safe. It's probably great. The best place to be is just to be honest with God. Job kind of shock, shares this when his, you know, his complaints. God really never rebukes him. He just basically says, you know, you're not going to understand. I don't understand. You're not going to understand. In the big picture of things, we do not understand why things happen. Only the Lord. The Lord is sovereign. The Lord is in control. Nothing is too difficult for him. Everything is, um, everything is within his grasp. But we can also give our feelings to the Lord. We can lay our heart out before him. We can be honest with God. Psalms are full of it. David says, where are you, God? I'm, I'm right here. Why can I not hear your voice? Where are you? And the Lord is good with that. He's okay with us talking to him. He's okay with us in our frustration. Lord, why are my enemies against me? Why don't you redeem me? Why don't you save me? He says. And God says, in the end, I'll, I'll save you. In the end, I'll redeem you. And the book of Job ends. <laughs> Wonderful. Job gets everything back. He gets more kids. He gets more wealth. But the point is, it doesn't matter. Job learns it does not matter. What happened to Job after this? At the very end. What happened? What happened at the end of the chapter? End of the book. What happens? What's that? He was blessed. Very good. He was blessed. But after that, what happened? He died. He still died. Now he was blessed. But in the end, Job still died. I always looked at that. Why does God sometimes do miracles? I've seen miracles. I mean, I've seen people that were had miracles of healing, and in the end, they still died. You know, I've seen I've seen struggles. I've seen people that have followed Christ's whole life, and you know, they still suffer sickness and they still die. We don't understand the big picture of things, but we know that God is in control, and that He's here. It's more than just this earth. As I read this, I, I thought one simple thing: if your faith in God is only due to a life of blessing. And ease. With all the answers simplified, tidy, and neat, you'll never finish the course. Because when the bumps of life come, where will you turn? And I Shay didn't know, didn't know what I was preaching about, but I loved his comments. He came up here. And we, that first song we sang, you know, he said, Hey, we can, we're victorious, even in the middle of death, and in the middle of tragedy, in this, we can still say we are more than conquerors. And it is true. We are more than conquerors. God with Christ, we're more than conquerors. And there's pain, and there's suffering, and there's bumps, and there's bruises, and there's tragedy, and there's loss, and we don't even know why. There's no easy answers. We're not walking into Ta Mr. Tanji's science class, and he says, Harry, here's the answers to life. It's going to be A through Z this week, okay? You know, just put them in there. It's, Lord, I don't know, but here's what I know. You're in control, you're a good God, and I can trust you. Amen. Um, I just want to pray for you. Uh, it's just been something on my mind, and I don't know. Maybe this is maybe this is not anything you've been struggling with. But maybe it's been me. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm just preaching myself. But when I read the Book of Job this week and last week, I just was struck with the thought that I have to place my trust in Him. And Lord, I say, God, I don't I don't understand what is going on, but I will trust you. I don't understand why the situations are happening here and why things maybe are not as easy as I wish. I'm praying for this, and, but God is still a challenge. And I just say, give me a sense where I trust him. Let me go back to Psalm 23 that I quoted. You know, 
We love that. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now that, I like that. I would love if the psalm just ended right there. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall never be in want. Wouldn't that be awesome? I will always have money in the bank. I'll, you know, I can put the ATM in, card in every time and get the bank come on. Hey, there's always rubles and dollars coming out. That'd be great. You know, I should never, never be in want. I should open the fridge and every day there's enough food in there. I never have to worry about it. I shall never be in want. You know, I get up the next morning, I'm never sick, I never have a cough, I never have a cold. I should never be in want. You know, anytime I want to call, our internet would always work. Wouldn't that be awesome, you know? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. I, for our Korean sisters here, every time you open the fridge, it's good kimchi, okay? I mean, you got good kimchi and kimbap. I mean, you got it at all. We can go to the store. Shay talks about all the time about going to the store, you find a product that has been missing and you buy it all. But we would never have that in Russia. We would go there, there's cheddar cheese, aged cheddar cheese, balayo milk and yogurt. Wouldn't it be awesome? You know, we shall not be in want. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. Job starts that way. Okay? But then it goes, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Now, it doesn't even get you all fear no evil, you know, but I walk through the valley of shadow of pain and suffering. And Job starts there, and he, that is where the entire book is at. God, why is this going on? His friends keep lecturing him, it's because of you, it's because of this, and you're arrogant. And, and there's little snippets of truth in their lines. I mean, it really is. If you pull it out, there's some things, but a lot of times they say it out of context, or they say it with the wrong spirit. One of the friends even says is, Listen here to the wise and pure voice of, of me. Okay, that's what his one of his friends says. Okay, that's that is a great kind of friend. I know it all. I'm going to tell you why you're wrong. You know, that's kind of the attitude. And then he goes at the end. Job simply goes, "Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death." And after God talks, he says, "Understands, you are with me." So even in the loss, even in the loss, when things are not easy, we can say God is with us. Amen. Why don't you just bow your heads if you I just want to have just a moment of prayer. If you would just close your eyes and bow your heads. I just feel like I need to just do this as a place of response to the Lord. Um, Daniel, would you mind coming up and doing the very last song? We, we're going to close with that last song that you did today. Um, just with eyes closed and head bowed, I just want to give a chance to respond. Maybe I want to ask if there's anybody here. I have two simple questions. I want to ask if you just want to respond with a raise hand really to me and I'll just be praying for you this week but how many of you are struggling with some of the questions of why you don't know why, you could, I mean there's a whole spectrum of this why is there even a God does God even care, you can have those kind of doubts of your faith or God why are you not hearing my prayers right now why, 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 why is this bad thing happening to me, why, why is my school situation like this, why is my work why is my family and and you're wrestling through that, and it's hard. It's hard on your faith, and you just say, Lord, I need some strength to trust you when I'm in the middle of this pain. And is there anybody here that says, you know, that's me, and I just want to lift my hand up, and I'll respond to that. I'll just be praying for people this week. Anybody? Thanks, 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 thanks. Thank you. Oh, four or five of us. You know, and there's things that I am. I'm going to just be honest. I'll raise my hand. There are things that I just say, God, I need to trust you, even when I don't understand. And we're going to pray that the Lord will somehow really encourage you this week, just with a sense of his peace. I pray so often, even with my kids, just about every night, the phrase, may the peace of God that passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And it's a picture, it's a verse from of Paul's where he simply says, I just pray God's peace, even when it doesn't make sense that you have God's peace. Second one, I just want to really just want to pray for some of you that maybe you have a, a very difficult situation going on right now that you are in the midst of. Maybe it's not at the maybe not sitting on the heap, the ash heap, you know, but but you've got some really difficult things going on, and you feel like you are being assaulted by all the the forces of the enemy. And maybe it's death, or maybe it's loss, or maybe it's family situation. But you just say, and just pray for me this week. I need some little. I need a load taken off my shoulders. I need to. I need somebody just to give a take this cares and anxieties off of me. Is that you? I want to be praying for you. Is anybody here? Okay. Yes. 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 There's a lot of us. Sometimes it's decisions we're making. Sometimes it's worries. There's threats that we have. I don't know what it is, but I'm just going to pray that God does something really supernatural for you. Lord, I just ask right now uh, that you encourage everybody here. 
Lord, you, you came out of the storm, it says, and you spoke to Job. And you spoke to him and said, where were you when I created all this? Where were you when I created the animals and the seas and the mountains? I can do it all. And Lord, you never answered, but all you did say is that nothing is too difficult for you. We are more than conquerors, and that's true, but it's more than conquerors because of you, not our ability, not even our faith, but because you are a great and awesome God. And Lord, we want to follow you, and we do not have simple answers, Lord. We do not even come to you with that, but we are coming to you with an attitude of trust. But once again, we want to be able to declare like Job did, almost in that prophetic tone, in the middle of all of his hurt and all of his pain, for I know my Redeemer lives. And so, Lord, I just pray right now for those that responded. Maybe they're, they're struggling with the questions. Maybe there's doubts or whys. and They just don't even have an answer. And the pain is there. Lord, I just pray that you comfort them with the peace of God that's beyond all understanding. And, Lord, for those of us that responded, we're just saying we have a heavy burden going on right now. Lord, I just ask that you'll just, first of all, bring around friends that can be an encouragement, that can help share the load. Lord, I pray that you give them the strength just to cast their cares upon you. Lord, do some miracles this week. Answer some things so supernaturally. Lord, whether it's decisions that need to be made or physical problems, Lord, I just pray that you go before them. Lord, you are a great and awesome God. We love you so much, Jesus, and we just are going to trust you. And we, we give you praise, we give you honor. We want to end this day as in the, in the same spirit of Job, we say, no matter what, I will follow you. Thank you, Jesus, in your name. Amen.